Hi, this is Dr. Nirmala speaking to you. I am a consultant um, infertility specialist and clinical director, Manipal Fertility, JP Naka. I have been into the practice of uh, IVF since 1998. So, as I already said, the causes could be either in the egg, the sperm, the embryo, or the uterus. So, what do we do? How do we understand whether the egg is at fault? When can the egg go? or be majorly at fault. One is the age. All of us are aware that as the age advances, there is a decrease in the quality of the oocytes. Now, this is a major concern today in today's scenario because we find a lot of women postponing their first child, postponing their marriage first, and then they want to complete their career before they even think about having a baby. So practically, we do not have any younger woman coming to our clinic, clinics asking for a baby at all. The age at which we generally get to see them is 30 or 31. And there are enough evidences in the literature to state that today there is an advance in the ovarian aging of the woman by easily six years. Which means a woman at 30 years when she comes, she has an egg reserve only of a 36 year old woman. Six years have she has already lost. So what can be done? This becomes an irreversible factor because there's no way, no way that anybody can reproduce eggs. Sperms are something which are continuously generated once in every two to three months. Eggs cannot be. They are produced once in the lifetime when she was in the womb of her mother. So age becomes a major factor. Apart from age, the other thing that can affect the quality of the eggs are underlying scenarios like polycystic ovary, endometriosis, poor ovarian response. These are all the factors which need a correction before they move them on to the IVF. Endometriosis, which can have a, a dramatic impact on the quality of the eggs that are generated from those ovaries. As far as the sperm, we have already spoken about correction, the DNA fragmentation. Yes, there are tests which can identify and give us uterus. The investigation that we would like to do is a basic ultrasound, uh, maybe also a 3D ultrasound, which gives us a better picture of the cavity. Then uh, the other thing is a hysterosampingogram, which is nothing but a tubal patency test. It not only gives us information about the tubes, because even if the tubes are dilated, blocked, or they, they, they have already formed what we call as hydrosalpingers. They could be major impact on the implantation process. They could also give us a picture of the uterine abnormalities, which could be congenital, which could be acquired in the sense there could be any kind of a uh, double uterus. There could be a single uterus with two cervixes. There could be two cavities. There could be an arcuate uterus, a septate uterus sinechiae or uh, even an absent uterus. So there are all these abnormalities which can be detected by an ultrasound, by a hysterosalpingogram and a hysteroscopy. So these are the ways. The other investigation that we like to do is a chromosomal testing. Though majorly there has been no great incidence of chromosomal abnormalities compared to the general population. But somebody who comes with a repeat implantation failure, yes, we would like to know her chromosomal status. Coming to the immunological mechanisms, the tests towards it, it's a, it's a big question to be answered. There are some people who feel that immunological tests make a sense. There are many who feel that they are a waste of expenditure and time and energy. What we understand by the immunological tests is that the, if you, if you look at when a, when, when a he or a she undergoes a kidney transplant, we always have heard about the kidney being accepted or the kidney being rejected. There's some phenomenon called a host versus graft rejection factor. So when the embryo which contains the proteins of from the derived from the sperm which is foreign to the mother, the immune mechanisms of the mother have to be dampened only then she will accept that embryo. If she has a heightened immunological mechanisms, her defense mechanisms are so strong, she is going to keep rejecting. So this is where the debate whether we need to do those tests or not to do, but it's a practice that when patient repeatedly goes through embryo transfer and is unable to conceive, yes, we understand if there are subtle aberrations.